to our uh, Nipponga Colloquium today. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jimmy Booth from the City College of New York. Jimmy's done a lot of really interesting work on the interaction between weather systems and the climate system over the last 20 or so years. And it's the kind of work that really gets me excited because it's fundamental and it asks questions that sometimes people would would shy away from asking because they sound so simple, but they're not well known. And that's what's so neat about it. Uh, his intellectual background is quite broad. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Engineering at the University of North Carolina, where his thesis involved analysis of the delayed logistic equation model for ice ages. So, I mean, that's all over the map. And from UNC, he went to University of Kentucky. Where are you from originally? From Kentucky. Oh, from Kentucky. Okay, went to, went to the University of Kentucky to tackle mapping numerically model turbulence into a phase space for his MS in Applied Mathematics, 2003. Took a MS, another one, at University of Washington in 2006 under Igor Kamenkovich, studying the role of mesoscale variability with passive traces in an eddy resolving model of the North Atlantic Ocean. I told you, all over the place. And then four years later, earned his PhD with Luann Thompson and Jerome Pateau at UW, studying um, the influence of the Gulf Stream on mid-latitude storms. And uh, he then spent two years as a postdoc fellow apparently shared between Lorenzo Polvani and Anthony uh, Del Genio, right, at NASA Goddard Institute, uh, and uh, Polvani at Columbia, of course, and he's been at CCNY for the last five years, and examining, as I said, all manner of cyclone climate system interactions, and today he's going to tell us about analyzing extratropical cyclones in the North Atlantic, impact surface forcing and steering, so Jimmy, it's a great Thank pleasure you. to finally have you there. Sure, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, it's fun to be back in a big atmospheric science department it's at University of Washington. The department is about this size. Where I am now, it's me and one other atmospheric science professor and then a wide range of geologists and uh, earth scientists. Um, the work that I'm presenting is work that I spend about half my time on. The other half of my time is spent looking at clouds and precipitation in observations and climate models. And this work that I'm going to present is more of a link to hazards and um, synoptic dynamics. The picture I'm showing up here is for the same day and on this side we have the distribution of the snowfall that accumulated and here you have the 500 hectopascal height field from a, a model forecast that was just about a 12, 12 hour forecast. And I'm showing this as motivation for my work. And the thing to notice is the huge amount of difference in the spatial variability here and here. And the thing that I'm interested in is saying, well, can I link these types of patterns to specific information about the hazards? Because climate models have a much easier time <clears throat> capturing this type of thing than they do this. So if you want, you can think of it as statistical downscaling, where we are able to link patterns in the large scale that are somewhat isotropic to patterns that are strongly anisotropic. Uh, there's a large list of collaborators here um, because I'm going to show a combination of about four years of work. Uh, I'll point out uh, Harold because he is the one who um, I work most closely on this. That Graz is a university in Austria. So um, I'm going to start with the definition of terms. So because of my math background, I always begin with the definition of terms. And uh, hopefully, for some people, uh, thinking about cyclone tracks versus storm tracks will be uh, something uh, that you, you can take away and learn. Um, <clears throat> an extratropical cyclone, as you know it, looks like this from a cloud deck perspective. And uh, these are the storms that I spend most of my time studying. I work with engineers who still to this day think that the extratropical cyclone is just a tropical cyclone with something extra. <laughs> eventually going to get through. There. I, I mean, they've got me when it comes to photons. But um, So for this group, we don't need to maybe spend too much time on this, but classically we have a low pressure center and these storms, we have fronts, which designate regions of strong gradients in the temperature. If we take a storm and separate it into air masses, we can think about a cold air mass and a warm air mass. This image comes from an idealized modeling study, and the thing that he wanted to point out was 
how the rising air as it moved forward and up had the equator where it moving cold air mass that was wrapping around and coming down. So they advect heat and moisture, they advect mass. <clears throat> this is an interesting one. So low pressure centers, because they're a low pressure center, as they move north, they're actually vacating mass from the polar region. So when you have a, a large amount of mass removal, that's actually when you're having more cyclones moving forward. And it's kind of different from how we'd like to think about it when we think about energy. So mass and energy are doing two different things with these storms. Key for this presentation, because of the low pressure center and the closed contour, we can track them. And so I'll be thinking about the tracks. But before I talk about cyclone tracks, I want to introduce storm tracks. And storm tracks in climatological literature come up a lot. They're regions of strong high pressure fluctuations. And if you look at a map of the storm tracks, it looks something like this, where you have for DJF, maximum over the oceans. And the way you calculate this is you first filter your meridional winds in time. So a, a fast Fourier transform allows you to put it into frequency space and then cut off the high frequency and the low frequency. So what you have left is the wiggles that take about four days, which are the wiggles associated with synoptic storms. So then you take that filtered data and then you look at it as a, uh, just a variance map. And it turns out that you can isolate the variability in a simpler manner where you just say, take the data at one day where you averaged it over a day and then subtract the previous day. And this time filtering is very simple and gives you almost the same sort of picture. So that's the kind of picture I'm showing you here. Uh, I like history, so a historical footnote. Um, in 1974, there was work that looked at uh, a single location um, data from ships fluctuations on two to three days and how that linked to baritonic waves. And then a uh, study from Blackman et al, the term storm tracks was coined. And in a paper in 1988 that um, Mike Wallace was the lead author on, he, tried, he kind of made an apology for the term storm tracks. So he talks here about how baritonic waveguides would be a much better term for the thing that I just defined. Um, but however, he says, uh, storm track is so deeply entrenched in the literature on this subject that it's unlikely to be replaced. So we're kind of stuck with it. In 2002, um, Ryan Hoskins uh, took advantage of a cyclone tracker of Kevin Hodges and looked at differences between storm tracks where you filter the data and then look at the variance and then cyclone track density. And in that paper, they talk about similarities and differences. And one of the things they highlight is, if you pay attention to the tracks, you can actually find mean tracks that are pretty interesting and distinct that wouldn't show up in features like this. <clears throat> so I say the bottom line is storm tracks and cyclone tracks have strong overlap. Cyclone traps have a different type of information, and perhaps that's one that's more interesting for hazards. The question of whether this, when you look at this interannually, looks like this interannually is uh, an open question. It depends on where you put your averaging box that you would use for averaging this and then sorting these. <clears throat> So moving on to section two, cyclone tracks and hazards. So I'm gonna track individual cyclones, and this has been done for a long time. Uh, this is a work from 1980 where they were interested in bomb cyclones, and in this case, they use forecast analysis and tracked the cyclones by hand. And so they have about 12 storms here, and in the paper they had about 30 storms or 40 storms. Um, I reviewed a paper a year and a half ago, where a group tracked all of the cyclones in the Pacific Ocean by hand for the 79 to 2012 reanalysis period. And I appreciated a lot of what the work they did in the paper, and, and I told them, 
you know, obviously no one's going to repeat this work, but can you try and map out your algorithm <laughs> so we know where it stood? And uh, I think after a couple of iterations, they got my point and it, it, it made it through. Um, nowadays, you don't really want to do this by hand. It's much better if you have a computer algorithm that does it. <clears throat> so the idea is you find the local minima in a reanalysis in something like sea level pressure, and then you link it in time. And when you link it in time, so sorry, I ignored the red line, I changed my figure. When you link it in time, that's when it's challenging, right? Because if you have a, a blob here at time one, and then at time two you have a blob here and a blob here, which one do you link? And so you have to minimize some cost function for what makes the most sense. And when you look at the actual tracks that come out, you actually can oftentimes see when the model the algorithm had to do some sort of merger. So a cyclone might have been moving, generating and moving along here, and another cyclone coming off the coast here. And in the end, the track you get looks something like this. And that merger piece is missing. And I think eventually we'll use the algorithms to talk about these merger storms, but we're not there yet. The Hodges tracker is a little different, instead of using sea level pressure, it uses maxima and relative vorticity. And if you've ever looked at relative vorticity fields, you know it's a pretty messy thing. So what he does is he first smooths the data spatially to what is uh, basically a truncated at 42 um, wavelengths around the globe, T42. And that corresponds to about a three degree by three degree resolution. And when you go to that resolution, uh, relative vorticity at 850 in a storm, an extra tropical cyclone, does look like a blob that you can keep track of. All right, the other piece of my methodology is how do I identify extreme events? For this, we have something like a count of all of the winds or a count of all of the rain events. And then we turn that into a PDF, and then we fit that PDF to a function, and this is the function that we use for fitting it. It's called the Pareto distribution. And the idea is that you want to take these specific parameters and adjust them until your fit is perfect. <clears throat> and the beauty of that is, what we started off with was this histogram that was kind of uh, <coughs> variable in space, and you end up with a function that's continuous in space. And then you can take your continuous function and you can invert it. And when you invert it, you get return periods. And so when you hear about a five-year storm or a 10-year storm, this is how you arrive at a 10-year storm. You start out with actual data, you fit the data, and then invert it to get to the return period. The other thing is that a function like this looks very similar to tails of distributions. And so when you go to do this type of analysis, the first thing you do is you figure out what tail am I going to use for making my fit. <clears throat> There's a whole science behind extreme value theory and there are algorithms that you can employ, and these algorithms are in R, and they're in MATLAB, and you can get them where they work for you. And I think six months of time kind of messing with this gets you to the point where you can really appreciate the nuances of what's reasonable and what's not reasonable for return periods. For our sake, the thing we want to remember is, when I say it's a five-year storm, that doesn't mean it occurs only once every five years. That means if I had a 1,000 years of record, it would occur on average about once every five years. So the first hazard I'll talk about is storm surge. So storm surge is kind of a deceiving word. It's not the total amount of water. Surge is the difference between the total amount of water and the normal tide. Okay? So the storm tide is the actual water level that's coming in. Storm surge is a better metric if you're just interested in the strength of storms. Because if you're at low tide, you could have water levels that don't necessarily flood, but you can generate a big enough surge that physically it's important. So that's why we're gonna think about the surge. <coughs> For this study, we're gonna take uh, sites along the east coast of the US and ask the question, does the strength and geographical extent of extreme surge differ for extratropical cyclones and tropical cyclones. Uh, this site is uh, Duck, North Carolina, so that's the Outer Banks. And then this site up here is in Portland, Maine. 
this study, um, before being published, went through a bunch of iterations. Our first iteration, we only looked in this region here. Um, uh, one of the reviewers came back and said, well, that's a very New York-centric point of view. Um, there's data available, why don't you look elsewhere? And um, the reviewer was right in a lot of ways in that if you're worried about this area, then you have these two. But once you become worried about this area, you need to worry about the other sides. And so even if you want to tell a story just in a New York-centric way, you need to worry about the edges. And it was helpful for us to think about the extent of these storms. Um, Hurricane Sandy was a big tropical cyclone that caused a lot of damage in New York. And after that, sto that storm, all of the focus um, on city planning for hazards turned to tropical cyclones and hurricanes. And one of the point we wanted to make with this paper was that extratropical cyclones probably are the more dangerous event to worry about because of the extent of time that they occur. Um, and I think in the end what we found is it really matters what you're interested in. If you're interested in a 100-year storm, then you need to focus on tropical cyclones. If you're interested in a two to five-year storm, then you need to worry about extra tropical cyclones. So what we did over here is we just said, if we consider a ranking for storms, what percentage are um, associated with a tropical storm? So solid lines are the sites that are farther south, Dash lines are the sites that's farther north. And the idea would be if you said for the top 10 events in Portland, Maine, 20% were hurricanes. For the top 10% in Duck, North Carolina, 60% are hurricanes. Newport, Rhode Island stands out here. And that's a geometry issue. So Newport sits here. Hurricanes, as they travel up and then transition to extra tropical, most often run off to the west in this direction. And in doing so, Newport sits right in the path for a strong inward infection. And I should have mentioned, how do these storms cause surge? They just pile water up. So it really just matters which direction the wind is blowing relative to the coast and for how long it's blowing in that direction. So Newport gets pretty unlucky. <clears throat> If we think about tracks, I separated into hurricanes and hybrid storms. And this set, the hurricanes are all running along the coast. This storm here was the one called Norida. So that was Hurricane Ida that came a nor'easter. This one that runs all the way out is Wilma, which is one of the strongest or deepest lows uh, for hurricanes in the record. This one here starts like this and goes down and goes like that. That's the um, George Clooney storm. <laughs> it's called the, the perfect storm and then it was made into a movie and George Clooney was the boat captain in that. And then the last one is Sandy. And so the first point is for TC tracks, either they have to hug the coast or it's some kind of exotic monster storm. For Northeast, so these are storms that affected New York City and the surrounding three, you can see there's a huge concentration of the tracks right in the area of interest. For Mid-Atlantic, these are storms that affected um, Virginia and North Carolina. Again, the storms, the storm center at some point had to pass very close. And in fact, much closer than we ever thought. And the reason that they have to pass so close is because the circular geometry of the winds associated with these storms means that as soon as a storm moves off the coast, it's no longer infecting water inward. It's infecting water uh, along the coast and therefore decreasing the chance that it's going to cause surge. So a theme that's going to come up a lot in the middle part of the presentation is the geometry and the importance of the geometry of the storm relative to the hazard. Triangles indicate where the cyclones end. And so these cyclones that ended down here are indicative of strong blocking. So there was uh, influence of blocking in that case. Since this study, work has come out um, from Tony Broccoli's group in Rutgers, and they showed that if you take a really long record of storms, the ones causing surge 
more often than not are the ones that are moving slower. And so slowing down the extratropical cyclones is a big deal. So what moves faster, a hurricane or an extratropical cyclone? Just anybody who's looked at either of them or both want to throw out a guess? So if I ask surge modelers, storm surge modelers will always say that hurricanes move faster. And the reason is they don't, they don't look at hurricanes down here. They only look at the hurricanes during the time when they're moving through that region. And so it's a, it's a, it's a weird moving target question. If you average over a whole life cycle, hurricanes are much slower, no matter what. But if you average over the time when a hurricane is creating surge along the, the US East Coast, it's almost a tie in the speed that they're moving. OK, so next we'll move to winter wind events. And for this, we use uh, NOAA station data. And NOAA defines the Northeast region as West Virginia, and then everything you normally think about the, the Northeast and Maine, um, perhaps. <coughs> They, they, they were assuming that West Virginia was going to join the Big East. <laughs> um, the question here is, are extratropical cyclones the cause of extreme winter wind? And if so, is there a char characteristic path that they take? The stations aren't equally sp spread out. So the squares indicate where we went back and redid the study taking only those stations that were equally spread out, and the results did not change. And in thinking about this, we're going to think about a simple and sort of subjective idea of how the cyclones move, although I found a paper from 1974 that had this same diagram in it. And the idea would be we've got storms that travel meridionally in the region, those that approach southwest and northeast, those that hug the coast, which I would call nor'easters, and then storms that move out to sea. Now, it turns out you can separate cyclones into these four sets. And I did this a couple of different ways. I tried this with clustering. And then I went and tried it with crosshairs. And with crosshairs, I found that things were more robust because I can move the crosshair just a little bit and look at the statistics and how they change. When I use clustering, the result was very sensitive to the overall size that I was using for my tracks. <clears throat> but these are contours showing how many uh, extratropical cyclones are in there for winter, for 79 to 2012. And the idea is that the number of contours that you're count counting in these four sets are the same. So these are your meridionally traveling in northeast to, or southeast to northwest, or southwest <coughs> to northeast. Uh, out to sea and then nor'easters. And then I did the same thing, but now I'm only looking at the tracks that caused extreme wind events. So I find in my data set the extreme wind events based on station data, and I say, okay, the dates of the extreme wind events, look at the tracks, and then what you see is that there's a clear preference for a specific path. Is there a, partic is there a particular location along the track where the wind, when the wind event occurred? How were they? Yeah, so um, here is saying now just take those that caused the extreme wind and the blue dot is where they were at the time it caused the extreme. And so you have a few that are out of the ocean, but for the most part, they're sitting up here. And the idea is that it's a geometry question again, where you say where is the strongest wind on average occurring in the storm and it's occurring near the cold front south or equator word of the low. And if we move the box of interest, so instead of looking here, we move a box of interest out over the ocean and look at reanalyses, we see a similar relationship in each case. So it's not saying these storms have stronger winds than these other storms, or these storms have stronger winds than these other storms. It's just saying the strong winds are in the right place to cause the most hazard. Another question. So for these, uh, these wind events, they're occurring during, I guess, DJF, yeah. that's the period. Are they necessarily due to the circulation of the storm, or could they be severe wind events associated with squall lines or something else in a yeah. winter storm? 
Yeah, so these, um, we were looking at the max wind, which was uh, average of wind over two minutes. It, and we did that because the gust data is a little messier. I think we would need to use the gust data to see if it was something in a squall line. Okay. Yeah. All right, so then our, our last hazard, which is not a hazard, um, the last uh, end product of an extratropical cyclone is precipitation. And here we're looking for at the Ashikand Reservoir, which provides 40% of the water, drinking water for New York City. And in this, we're asking the question, what is the relative contribution of hurricanes and extratropical cyclones to extreme precipitation in this area? <clears throat> and is there a characteristic path for the cyclones and extratropical cyclones? All right, so if we take the top 50 one-day precipitation events for the region, um, associate them with either extratropical cyclones or tropical cyclones, and then also separate the tropical into those that underwent ET and, or extratropical tropical transition and those that didn't, then what you can see is for, for extratropical cyclones, it's a, kind of a big mess. For hurricanes, the, the storms had to move pretty close and most often went through ET transition. About 11 or 20% of the time, it's a hurricane causing it. This disappointed my collaborator who thought it was going to be hurricanes all the time. Um, so we did this for him, which is to say, well, if the hurricanes are coming, when they arrive, they're much more likely to cause it. So now what we're saying instead is, what percentage of all of the events caused a big event? And if you compare on this side, TCs, and then down here, extra tropical cyclones, you can see well, extratropical cyclones are occurring all the time, and only this tiny percent of the time do they cause extreme rains. Now, why does the pattern look so crazy? Well, that's because you can get an extreme rain event in the region either from the warm sector or from the cold front. And when it's from the cold front, you almost want to think of it as like a knife edge moving along one area. And if the cold front stays in the same, raining over the same location, then you're able to get precip precipitation for 12 to 15 hours in one location. And so these are cyclones that take this track as compared to this track. And we were able to separate that out in the study. All right, so now shifting from the synoptic weather side of hazards to the climate side, we're going to talk about the North Atlantic isolate oscillation and its relationship with cyclone tracks and blocking. What is the North Atlantic oscillation or the NAO? Okay, so this is a picture that you can find on the web if you just do an image, Google image search. And it's not clear who made this, but it's on a web page that belongs to Mark and West Visbeck. And what's nice about it is that it indicates during NAO positive, so the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, you have stronger low pressure and stronger high pressure. And you have the storms that come across the North Atlantic aimed for Great Britain and uh, Scandinavia. When you're in, in a negative phase, instead, the contrast between low and high pressure is weak, and there's fewer storms in this region, and instead, the extratropical cyclone track is more zonal. And then he indicates with a little hint that there's also something here, and this something here is going to come up in what I'm talking about. Why do we care about it? Well. It's the leading mode of variability in the North Atlantic. So it explains how areas like this are correlated with areas like this. So in this case, anti-correlated in terms of uh, precipitation. NOAA has three different websites dedicated to the NAO. And it's because we want to understand 12 to 15 day weather prediction. And we're still not good at it. And the hope is that the one thing that'll get us close to it is something like the NAO. And recent studies uh, from Adam Scaife's group indicate that we might actually have some seasonal prediction with this thing on one to three month time scales. So uh, the relationship with storms that you just saw in that schematic was shown using uh, cyclone tracks. And this was back in a time when you didn't have to make figures that anybody could see. <laughs> um, 
But I just tell you, over here, you have a denser population of tracks like this, and in this case, a denser population of tracks like this. What's interesting is that uh, um, Jeff Rogers has another paper where he talks about how there's no or very little relationship between storm tracks and the NAO, which is funny because I'm using this as my motivation slide to talk about the relationship between the two. Um, so we built a statistical extratropical cyclone model. It was uh, primarily Tim Hall with a lot of input from me. And Tim Hall had made previous uh, statistical models for hurricanes. And the idea is that you need some training set. So we have the tracked extratropical cyclones and then some other information. So we have predictors, so an annual cycle of 500 hectopascal zonal wind, um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and the NAO. And then you have this model. So it's, you, know, you, you run it, and it comes in, and it generates the track. It starts with initial location, and then it builds its evolution in time, and then it decides where it's going to end. And <clears throat> Each of these factors, the genesis and the track vector and the lysis, all depend on these predictors. And the, each simulated vector in the track is going to be the historical mean track for that given lat-long location, and then a stochastic component. So first of all, you have to roll the dice and say, all right, at this time, where is the storm going to start? Well, which phase of the NAO are you in? Well, what's into it looking like? All right, put a track there, and then let this track build up and move in space. So it says, okay, well generally when a storm is right here on average, it would want to go in that direction. So that's what it's doing, but then let's add some noise to that. And so the noise component is random plus a little bit of history of where it's been before. So the very first time it's just random, and then after that, what did it do before plus random. And I don't know if there's any other model like this out there. And um, the reanalysis folks haven't found me yet. I'm hoping to make it better before I can go off and make my tens of dollars selling it to them. <laughs> this is a climatology for different phases, and this cannot be done with actual data. First of all, because we're only looking at the most extreme cases, and second of all, because even if we looked at the most extreme cases, we wouldn't have enough data to robustly put together pictures like this. This side over here is saying fix, NA, fix INSO in the negative phase and then change NAO. And then this is on the other side, fix INSO in the positive shades and then change NAO. So anytime you're looking up and down, it's changing NAO. Anytime you're looking across, you're changing INSO. And a much better figure to look at than this one is this one, where it's saying for each panel, it's the middle minus that difference. So NAO positive, actually, if you look down any of these, NAO positive does a big change in the amount of tracks over here. So that's what we already knew. So over near Iceland, more tracks during NAO positive less than NAO negative. What we are interested in was the relationship with INSO and how that relationship with INSO changes depending on the NAO. And then particularly, when do we get more of these strong storms in our region? And it turns out you want NAO negative or INSO negative, but then NAO also has an influence on where the storms end up going. <laughs> okay. So this is a starting point. We're now trying to improve this model. We're not too convinced about the red noise that we're adding, that it makes perfect sense. We definitely don't get anything in this model like successive storms. So there's no way to, we know in observations you'll have a track that goes one way and then right after that another track comes along and do that. Our model won't be able to capture that yet because we don't have memory going from one genesis to the next genesis. But uh, it's an exciting and different way of thinking about these storms that's based totally on statistics. <clears throat> Jimmy, I know you're probably going to say something about blocking, but given that you don't have successive tracks, does that affect the blocking stats that you get out of this? So we don't, for this one, we don't have any blocking stats that come out of it. Oh. All we get is the track statistics. Okay. But what we want to do is build blocking into this model instead. It's, so it, it, we want to actually 
include it as one of these predictors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's interactive, of course. If you have successive tracks in a certain direction, they may well be transporting low PV and building your block or maintaining it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we're we're not. That's too advanced for us. We're, but interesting. The issue about the NAO brings us to blocking because atmospheric blocking for some is strongly correlated with NAO. And the idea is that when you have more blocking in the North Atlantic, you're predominantly in the NAO negative phase. So what's a block? A semi-stationary high pressure system. In summertime, we think of them over land. Typically last five days to two weeks. They block the normal flow that would be coming westward. We don't understand blocks as well as we do cyclones. And I think the reason why is because Typically, they're associated with pretty nice weather. So, you know, why you don't question things when they're good, just let it be, and then move on. Um, Hurricane Sandy took a very abnormal path where it hooked inward, and that hooking inward was partially due to a block which appeared to steer the storm. And so the issue of steering storms is what I'm interested in. We know that the blocks can be generated in the wake of extratropical cyclones, but then how do they how do the blocks influence the next storm? So <coughs> for tracks now we're going to think about the relationship between the blocking and the cyclones, and then we're related to the NAO. Now here in green, in the lime green, that's the climatology for blocking. And these contours are every 2.5, so 2.55, 7.5, and this is for uh, cold season, so November through April. <clears throat> and then the shading in the background is showing you the climatology of what cyclones do. So this is cyclones per season per five degree grid box, five by five degree grid box. So your cyclones typically do this. And then the blue are just examples of some extratropical cyclone tracks. Um, this side, this is what I'm calling my troll diagram. I don't know if you all know the eraser head trolls, they have the crazy hair. That's what I see here, just the crazy hair on the top of some of the eraser. Each point is telling you the direction that the cyclone is moving and the speed that it's moving. So these ones out here are my fastest storms. These ones in here are my slowest storms. Storms that move this way are southward moving storms, southeastward moving, eastward moving tracks, and then nor northward moving tracks. And then this direction is just calculated for the time the storm is in this region here. So I can separate out where the storms are going and then put them all onto a scatter plot like this and then uh, there's so many of them that the contours tell me the density. And so the highest density of tracks are here. So the mean direction that the storms most likely take is kind of 35 degrees off the uh, zonal path, which is pretty much just like what you see here in this track density diagram. Mm -hmm. All right. So before I combine everything together, one last thing I have to do is I have to take my blocks and put them into a cyclone-centered view. So this means that along each extratropical cyclone track, I grab the block where the cyclone is right in the center. Uh, put these on the bottom uh, to help uh, orient you. So this is a cyclone-centered view of wind speed. So this is taking a lot of different cyclones, wherever they are in their life cycle, averaging the winds around the cyclone, so the cyclone is in the center, and there you can see the maximum wind, and that's where I want it to be from my earlier study about wind maximum, and this is for um, water vapor path, so the column water vapor, and there you can see in the composite a picture of the warm sector with the polar moving, higher water vapor, and then the cold with the low water vapor. You do the same sort of thing for all the extratropical cyclones in the North Atlantic for blocks, and you look like this. So the highest amount of blocking occurs north and uh, east of the cyclone center, about 
12% of the time for these cyclones. And then if I have this type of picture for each of my cyclones, then I can take my cyclones, which are associated with the propagation direction, separate into the different directions that they're moving, and then saying for the different directions they're moving, what percent of tracks have a block, and what fraction of, the, of this region is blocked. And what you can see is for both of these metrics, it's when you're either moving southeastward or when you're moving north or northwestward, right? So now take this type of picture and show it in a map view. So if I sort my cyclones into those that predominantly go northward, and then I say, what's my cyclone centered block composite look like? You get a huge bullseye for heavy blocking here. If I take the cyclones that were slow, so these were the ones that were not fast enough to even have a propagation angle, then the block center moves, and now we have high amount of blocking all in this region, and a distinct lack of blocking in this area as compared to climatology. Southeastward tracks, these are the messy ones that are doing like this. In that case, the block center, or the block maximum is now sitting off to the north and west, of the cyclone center. And then for eastward tracks, so those that take a uh, nice path, there is very little blocking at all. Actually, too little blocking compared to climatology, statistically speaking. Right? So now we're starting to get a picture where it says, well, your block location geometrically relates to the path the storm's moving, and it might even be that there is steering involved. So the idea is that if you associate this block with a high pressure system, then in this case it's generating northward steering, in this case it's generating westward steering, in this case it's generating southwestward steering, and then you add that to the mean flow and you get something where it's moving southeast. Now for some of my co-authors the cyclone centered view was too weird, so we also did the geometric or sorry geographical view of those blocks for the different tracks so this is for northward tracks slow tracks southeastward tracks and what's interesting is when we move away from the cyclone centered view for slow especially we don't get the same sort of emphasis on what's going on with the block and that's because when you move away from cyclone centered you're not you're not retaining the geometry between the cyclone location and the block location. Because in this picture, the cyclone could be anywhere in this region. Okay, so now we take our trolls and we separate them into NAO negative phase, NAO positive phase, versus block present phase and no block present. So the bottom has nothing to do with the top. These are two distinct separations. But the point is that NAO negative is when we get the most spread in our propagation direction as compared to NAO positive where things are nice and focused. And similarly, no block present versus block present gives us a similar spread. But there's a subtlety here. And now, if I say, take the track density and separate it into those blocked and those that are NAO negative, you can actually see the blocked gives us more emphasis in the cyclones that pass over, pass over the Northeast US, which are the ones that are most likely to cause hazards in the region. And these two diagrams, in fact, we focus on the mean, the maximum in the contours you can see the shift in location from being north of 45 degrees to being south of 30 degrees. And in fact, these two two-dimensional histor histograms are actually statistically different at a significant level. <clears throat> I mean, like 99th percentile, and that's crazy because they look the same, right? And that's where, where statistics maybe get a little messy. Um, lest you think I've solved anything or figured it all out, Remember that, in this case here, even when I had this great bullseye for northward storms, it was only about 27% of the time. So that means that there's 70% of the time there are northward tracks that don't have a block present. 
that's annoying. And I thought, well, maybe all it is is we're right on that threshold and the block is almost there. So on this side, we're looking at the time evolution for northward tracks that have a block present. And we're looking at Z500. And as expected, when there's a block present, there's this huge anomaly, positive anomaly in the Z500 field. So this is consistent. And we're looking at day 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then on this side, it is those that move northward that don't have any block present. And in that case, there doesn't start out to be in a block. And instead, the, what you see in Z500 is kind of a pretty typical evolution of a trough ridge pattern. Okay? So the cyclones can move northward without blocks. And why that is remains uh, something that I'm trying to understand. <laughs> uh, so this is how I make notes to myself. This was not supposed to be in the presentation. Give me the difference between the second panel on the left in terms of the ridges from the top one, is that equal to the little bit of a blip you get in the one over to the right in the second column? Uh, so it, it's so this one here would be an increase of about um, 50, and yeah. over here you're going from 75 up to yeah, it's it's similar. So, and so I mean, what I, what I'm wondering is, it, does the cyclone contribute? Can you does this actually help you isolate what the cyclone contributes to the block? Well, yeah. So um, that's great. Yeah, and my co-author on this stuff and fall was very excited with this element here where he, he has an argument that the extratropical cyclones are actually helping maintain and build the blocks by providing um, negative PV aloft. And in this case, you see with time, the block is getting bigger. But as you said, John, this one is kind of changing in the same amount. So is this, is this increase, is it diabetic or is it just part of the circulation? Yeah. Um, and that was one where we said, let's just write a GRL paper. Uh, <laughs> he has a student who's following up on it. And, and he, you know, his bias is that the, the moisture really matters. But I, I think that this particular figure could be interpreted to say it's just, it's just dynamic. It's not thermodynamic. All right, so um, to conclude, we have our tracks for strong wind storms strong storm surge and strong precipitation and uh, I think I want to make some points. This is what the figures show. I think that this is nice. We can associate hazard with extratropical cyclones to make generalizations about the storm's causing event. Um, we can see that blocks steer the extratropical cyclone and the steering path depends on the relative position of the block. And blocks more than the NAO help identify northward moving tracks. Um, and I would like to also add another bullet, bullet point, which is that cyclones aren't the only thing causing hazards. Um, but it's certainly the thing that I'm focused on right now. So thank you for your time. So questions for Jimmy? Maybe a basic enough meteorology question, but why would somebody think that blocks don't steer at the top of those It seems like at least watching the loss of storms, it seems to be pretty typical. Like what would what, what the theory suggest why that wouldn't be the case? No, you're right. This was this was uh, not an example of of proving uh, 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 an assumption wrong. This was more an example of uh, characterizing a generally held assumption. Yeah. What kind of statistical analysis do you use for your statistical model? Uh, so that is based on Poisson regression. And so the <coughs> idea there is that it's a regression model, but then anytime you do the regressions, it's E to the, and then the regression expression. And the reason you do that is that anytime you have a data sparse uh, amount of information, you want, you, a Poisson regression allows you to worry about areas that are pretty far away where you don't really have a lot of information. And then as you get closer and you get more and more information. Because we said, 
Okay, so at each lat long point in our grid, the time series of an extratropical cyclone occurring at that point can be correlated with the NAO, but it also can be correlated with the tracks occurring anywhere else. And so each of those pieces we needed. And so Poisson regression it was. The other thing that pulls in there is when the track moves in time, it's what's called a track increment. And for the track increment in the X and Y direction, <clears throat> when you're initially building the stochastic model, you want those to be decorrelated. And so he has, Tim has developed a method for the cyclone track that we used here that does a lot of gymnastics of taking the, the increments in the XY direction and normalizing them and then shifting them so that what you end up with is two de decorrelated pieces of information for the meridional and zonal component. And that's pretty much, his, that's the most exciting part for him. So if you ask him about the model, he'll talk about that a lot. Michael. Was there anything in the analysis that you did that would give you an indication of whether there's a favored pressure distribution or wind distribution in an extratropical or tropical cyclone that would produce greater or less damage? And that, that, you know, not all extratropical cyclones have the same wind field structure or it depends on the stage in their life cycle. Is anything in your analysis that might point to structural characteristics of the cyclones themselves? No, and in fact, the correlation between surface wind and um, pressure gradient was weaker than we thought it would be. Um, but this work has helped me uh, think about another question, which is, what are the most expensive extratropical cyclones? And we did a study for that separately that's published in um, the New York Academy of Sciences, where we used the NOAA database, the STORM database, actually includes information about costs. And in that, what we found was, if a storm created uh, coastal flooding and snow, then it was most expensive for the tri-state area. I would say most expensive for the U.S., though, would probably be these, because you get the cost of wind here and then the cost of snow here. So these types of storms, because of where we always expect maximum snow to fall, would be dumping a lot of snow in the Chicago area. And so basically, Sorry, the Madison area, and, it, uh, <laughs> and, and so basically, like you say, all right, we worry about where most people are, and then getting multiple hazards. And those are the ones that I suspect. But as far as actually putting, getting that cost, that is an impossible question. Um, the insurance company keeps half of that information, and that's proprietary, and they don't want to share it. There was one study on snowstorms that actually got a hold of snow, snow insurance data. Um, but uh, we've tried contacting and we can't get it. New York City is ready to work. They want to they want to quantify the cost per inch of a snowstorm, and they're documenting that information for New York City. And so it's super cool, and that's one side of it. And that the cost is much larger than I thought it would be. And it's overtime for um, MTA employees, so the transit uh, employee overtime, and then overtime for the uh, uh, waste removal, because that's all the snow. Well, if wind speed and direction are a multiplier of that, but that's not my question. It'd be interesting to know that. My question is, um, this is really interesting analysis on a lot of levels. I'm, I'm intrigued that <clears throat> have you looked at transitions in the NAO signal and what sort of things are going on around the transitions interseasonally? Uh, because that that's a really interesting such a question to me, is what's happening, you know, either just storm tracks, jet uh, structures, where are the cloud masses being distributed on storms and so on, uh, when yeah. you're getting into a transition. What controls it, cyclones or larger scale? Yeah, I, I haven't looked at it yet. Uh, I don't know. You know there, was, there was that work from Heather Archambault that looked at transitions in NAO and PNA. That's the only things that I've seen on, on that side of things. Transition pieces are difficult. For my PhD, I looked at transition pieces as they might relate to the Gulf Stream. And the, the difficulty is, once you have a transition, you have to spell out which flavor of transition is it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, couldn't, I didn't, at the time, think of a good starting point. Because you have those that start to go into NAO positive, but only a little bit, and then come back down and maybe stay neutral, versus those that go very strong. Yeah. Maybe if we started with the strongest transitions. Yeah, that might be a way to do it, right? Is to take the gradient over a period of days that you know spans four, four units or something. Yeah, like that, yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, and also Tim Wooling has some work where he talks about the transitions for those, his three locations of the jet hypothesis. So mm -hmm. there he kind of says, well, the, the, for the 850 wind, zonal wind, you can just take that and turn that into three climatological locations for the wind and then put your NAO into one of those phases or transitioning between one of those phases. Um, but other people seem to think that the, the three wind piece is, is maybe something that's more of a statistical artifact rather than a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for our speaker? Okay, then uh, you'll join me in thanking Jimmy again. Thank you. It was very fun coming and visiting. Enjoyed it.